the Grace Hopper film. I got super excited to do this when I was hanging out online one day uh, with my friends Vanessa Hurst and Dave Hoover. Uh, this, the like 1900th Steve Jobs movie had come out. <laughs> and you know, he was a product guy. Um, <laughs> and at the same time, at the same time, some startup guru who's always making mistakes said if you wanted a good programmer, you had to get someone who had been programming since they were a teenage boy. I mean, I got real mad at, about that because I ran Chicago Women Developers and I taught women how to program. Women who were in the middle of their career who missed the first boat. And they were some really good programmers. And then Dave says, you know, Grace Hopper didn't learn to program until she was 37 and look what she did. And I was like, Grace Hopper, who's that? Because, you know, I don't know everything. And I got super excited about this woman because she seemed amazing. So I was like, you know what? That's my next film. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to make. Um, and we ran a, an Indiegogo campaign, raised a lot of money, um, which is all gone now. So, you know, <laughs> real slow going. Um, and we're making this film about Grace Hopper. And what has been lovely about this film in the making of it is she's opened up as a human being because all you hear about her is this legend stuff. You know, when we talk about women in computing, we never talk about, you know, the traits that are not precious. They're always very nice. They always achieved something amazing. Um, we don't humanize women. So I got really excited about making this film and humanizing her and turning her into a real person that you could actually relate to instead of this superhuman that you could not connect to. And you, you would think I could never be that woman because she really did. I mean, she really was very smart, genius. You, you had to be that when she came up. But she was also just a normal person, really passionate about something. And she went for it, just like the rest of us. So here's Grace, born in 1905, died in 1992, pretty old broad. Uh, 1905 is when the ten Titanic sank, to give you like reference. One of the first kids on her block to get electricity in New York City. Good to know. One of the first women who could vote in the United States for the president of our country, which is amazing. Uh, she went to Vassar at 17 and got a degree in mathematics, later began teaching there. I think I have a really sweet picture of her as a kid. You can see this one up here. This is Grace at Vassar. I think she's about 17 here. There are not a lot of pictures of Grace as a child, just because of the time. Uh, she later went to NYU to do some graduate work, and later went to Yale, where she was one of the very first women in the United States and in the world to get a PhD in mathematics. Actually, to get a PhD anywhere. She was one of 30 women that year to get a PhD. Yale did not actually admit women until 1969. So this was the 30s, and she got her degree there, which shows you a little bit of how exceptional and how driven she was. Uh, Grace was married. She married in graduate school. She had a commuter marriage. Her husband taught at NYU. Uh, she taught at Vassar. They met up on the weekends at their lake house. She doesn't have any children. Uh, she was later divorced. She kept her ring on, though and never said anything about this divorce. She just let people believe that her husband died in the war. <laughs> you love her for that, but you also think about the stigmatism attached to divorce at the time she got divorced, which was the 40s. Um, in, right after Pearl Harbor, like everyone else, Grace decided that she wanted to join the military, and she tried to get into the Navy. She tried three times each time rejected. She was too old at 36 to join the Navy. Then she was too underweight because she's like 5'2 and less than 100 pounds. Then it was that her job as a mathematics professor was 
important to national security, and they could not spare her. And she just pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and got into the Navy. And this is a picture of Grace at Midshipman School. This is her at 37. She graduated, of course, top of her class. Um, and was really excited to go do something great for her country, which she was hoping was going to work with her old advisor from NYU and do some cryptography. Instead, she was sent to a hot, stinky, loud basement. It was top secret, Crufts Laboratory at Harvard. They didn't tell her what it was. She just had to show up in a basement at Harvard. So this is uh, a picture of her and her commander, uh, Charles Aiken. And this is parts of the difference engine. Uh, what the machine that she worked on was actually based on the analytics engine, which they actually had a model of in Harvard's uh, attic. And when Charles Aiken was trying to figure out how his computer was going to work, he was stuck and actually took a look at this model from Babbage and figured out how to make his machine work. So that's, that's kind of a really cool thing. This is what she walked into. This machine is 51 feet long. It's eight feet high. Uh, it weighs something like 10,000 pounds. It runs on relays and electromechanical switches. Uh, you can't see this because it's terrible. I didn't think about how big this was. Uh, but these, this is all paper tape. Right beside this is a typewriter where you type in like corrections to your code. This is amazing. They use this to run uh, ballistics. So, you know, if you wanted to calculate some ballistics, like where things were going, if you wanted to calculate the probability of, uh, oh, this is this is really important. One of the very first, one of the very first calculations done on this machine was with John Van Neumann of the Manhattan Project. Uh, you know, calculating some probability about what, what was going to happen with an atomic explosion, which is kind of amazing to think that that was happening. And if you read up on John Van Neumann, he's the most interesting guy. He's like the pollinator of all of these ideas all over the country in every academic circle uh, during that time, just as a side note. When, when Grace saw this machine, she thought it was the most beautiful thing in the world. You have to think about that. She walked in. It's hella hot. The machine is running. It's really loud. It's all relays. It has a, it has a, like a rotor, a motor that that runs runs everything. Uh, it smells like cigarette smoke. Uh, <laughs> a really fun side note is when I went to visit this machine, which you can also visit at Harvard. Uh, and I, I got the tour, and, and uh, when, they, when they first plugged this machine in after cleaning it up and redoing it, it smelled like cigarette smoke. And they realized there was so much tobacco from these cigarettes from the 60s and 70s in the bottom of this machine that they just thought someone was smoking in the building. So you can just imagine this, all of these sailors smoking, trying to run this machine. Um, but it was still the most beautiful thing she had ever seen. Which is amazing because Grace, Grace did not get that reception when she showed up. These men actually drew straws to see who was going to sit next to the old woman coming in. Mind you, she's only 37, right? What's great about this, though, is she is second in command. Except for this guy, all of these mofos, she's their boss. Because Grace does not play. She's very nice. Uh, but, but she is also one tough lady. The Mark II, or the Mark I, ran 24 hours a day, seven days a week during the war. They worked in shift. All of these people, this is, this is about it for the team. I think there's one more woman. Uh, they worked in shift 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the duration of the war. I love thinking about this. Because every time I see a bro coder talking about slamming his energy drinks and like code or die so we can get this app out, I'm like, motherfucker, they won the war. They did it first. <laughs> <laughs> I get really excited about it. But before they could do that, nobody had built a computer for war. This was the first electromagnetic computer. Grace had to write the manual for how to use this machine. She had to learn the machine, 
manage all these people and write the manual. This is all she did. She actually wrote the first computer manual. It's her fault. <laughs> you, can see, you can see her name here, everyone on this original team here. Uh, here's Grace. She's not listed as a person who wrote this because this is the Navy. Uh, that was her first day. Her first day, Charles Aikens said, you're gonna write the manual. And she says, I've never written a book before. And he says, you're in the Navy now. And that's how that happened. So she wrote that. But I posit that Grace was more than just a, you know, com computer hacker. Uh, she was one of the very first computer pirates. Did you need to take that <laughs> photograph? And we're going to get to that. But first, I am going to play the trailer teaser from my film. <laughs> Look at all that tape. That's really the noise. How did you know so much about computers then? I didn't. How did it was you? the first one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So we're back to Pirate Grace. After all, she invented the patch. You think about this, this is a patch. This is the original patch. I know you all been getting patches. This is the original patch. This comes from the Mark I. This is where they would put little pieces of tape over the wrong holes they punched. Grace invented this. Grace also invented hacking where she would take these programs and delete things that she didn't want. She thought it could run faster. She could change things. Charles Aiken hated this. He liked things to run exactly how they were. And Grace Lee liked to be lazy and cut a bunch of stuff out if she could come up with the same answer. We all identify with that. So she invi invented the first patch. One misconception, oh, I forgot this. She also flew a Jolly Roger in her office, which is just hilarious as far as her like being a pirate, as far as that theory goes. Uh, she believed that asking permission was not as easy as asking for forgiveness. If you've ever heard that, that uh, phrase, that comes from Grace Hopper. She was actually talking about uh, following your dreams. I think I have taken that to the extreme in a lot of ways. Um, but this was about, about following your dreams. But she did have this Jolly Roger. She also had a clock that ran backwards in her office, um, just trying to just throw people off who had first started visiting. Uh, she also believed that anything, anything you needed could be liberated from someone else for free. Every piece of furniture in her office was stolen from another branch of the army or the, the military, the army, the marines, didn't matter, as long as it wasn't Navy. Everything that she had was liberated from someone else's office. Uh, she, also, she also firmly believed that software should be free. So you think about this, and you think about you know, the, the arc of, of the history of software, and Grace was the first person who was like, no, we should make the software for free. People can pay for support, but the software should absolutely be free. And of course, you have to remember that at this time, a lot of people weren't using computers. The software was being used by not even enterprise, military and enterprise, but she really believed this. So what's this? It's a bug. All right, a lot of people, a lot of people misconstrue the fact that because this exists, Grace Hopper invented the bug. She did not. Bug in the machine is something that has been been in colloquial English for quite some time. What she did was find the first actual case of a bug being found. This poor moth <laughs> was beaten to death 
between the relays of the Mark II, which was the second version of Charles Aiken's machine. What she did, which was brilliant, is later on in her career, when she became an advocate for computing, she really wanted everyone to adopt computing, was she told and retold and retold this story, and this became part of her legacy, this bug idea. So she did not invent the bug, uh, but she did popularize it, and she did find the very first bug. A really funny story that not a lot of people know about Grace Hopper is that later on, because of that bug thing, one day when she did not want to work anymore, she went to the local joke shop. shop. Uh, Grace will tell you someone did it. Like every, all of the footage about Grace says someone. Someone went to this local joke shop in Boston where us Navy waves are not allowed to go and bought all these bed bugs and put them into machines. Now, <laughs> she actually dumped all of these, uh, not just this, but several, several of them, into the Mark II between those relays because she thought it would be hella funny. Um, <laughs> which, of course, made the machine stop working and everyone got the day off. But Charles Aiken, being who he was, got all of the best vacuums that he could to clean out the Mark I. Does anyone know what happens when you get all of the dust out of a relay machine? does not work. There's not enough contact to make it work. So the relays are hitting each other and they're not firing. It took two weeks for the machine to start. So that <laughs> that's, your <laughs> that's your lesson there is Grace wanted a day off and she got two weeks off. Um, and this is why she can't own up to the story ever. But now that she's dead, her coworkers have all fessed up and they're like, yeah, that was Grace. That was Grace's sense of humor. That's what happened. Um, so that's, that's a really nice one. She introduced bugs on purpose. Um, another misconception is that Grace invented COBOL. So you will see this on every website. Here is this picture. Everyone's super familiar with it. There's Grace. She's super old now, holding this COBOL thing because this is her, this is her legacy. And every COBOL, uh, it still exists. <laughs> every, every COBOL website has this picture of Grace and talks about Grace Hopper nonstop. Grace Hopper didn't invent COBOL. This was invented by a committee. COBOL was actually a sh short-term uh, programming solution, by the way. You know, this was supposed to be like a three-tiered three solution to figure this stuff out. Uh, and COBOL was the short-term solution, and they never got to the mid-term or the long-term solution, because COBOL just worked so well. Now it's, what, 75 years old, is still working. Um, but she did not invent this. What she did, what we should credit her for is inventing the very first compiler. This is the A to O compiler. You know, Grace, really thought that computers could do more than mathematics. Um, you know, and she's got this great quote. She's like, I had a working compiler and no one would touch it. No one believed me. They thought all computers could do were mathematics. And she invented this A to O compiler, which basically changed everything. This is what she should be the most famous for and isn't. Because compilers are really hard to explain to the public. Bugs are super easy. Um, but this kind of changed everything. So what happened with COBOL was that she was on the committee, not necessarily the programmers that built it, but what they based COBOL off of was a program she wrote called Flowmatic. So Flowmatic was like the counterpart to Mathematica, uh, which was which was Fortran. Um, she wrote this code, Flowmatic, again, small picture, small screen. I didn't think about your giant screens. Um, she wrote the precursor to it. And everyone that I talked to uh, that was on that committee of developers that, that made uh, COBOL talks about how instrumental Flowmatic was. And that Grace Hopper is the grandmother of COBOL, not, not the inventor of it. This is where Grace gets famous. 
Does, does anybody know what these are? <laughs> no, they're actually telephone wires. They represent nanoseconds. This is not a table. This is not a pipe. So these are actually telephone wires. They're cut, uh, oh, like this long. I meant to bring some, but I forgot them. Um, and they represent a nanosecond. And Grace, Grace went into the Navy and retired several times. And during her third stint in the Navy, she did become this person who uh, was primarily there just to promote computing. And one way she did this was she walked around with these nanoseconds and she explained to people how long it took energy uh, to travel, how long it would take a piece of information to travel from here to the moon. And you can actually find these, and I should have, I should have found this uh, earlier, but you can actually find these talks online of Grace talking about nanoseconds and explaining to, you know, she'll be like, and I have to explain it to the generals. It takes a whole lot of nanoseconds, and she's quite old at this time. She's in her, you know, late 70s, whole lot of nanoseconds to get the information from here to the moon, and she's adorable, and it's very funny. Um, but this is where she's... She gets very famous as giving these talks. Uh, she has a battleship named after her. This is, it's not a battleship. I, I got schooled by someone in the Navy. This is, this is a warship. They stopped making battleships in the 50s, okay? <laughs> so she has a warship named after her. She actually has a retirement party on this, on this boat. By the way, the woman who planned this party, I talked to, her name is Brenda Sullivan. The woman who planned this party wrote the code that detects space junk so we all don't die. <laughs> she was just, she would just like talking about this party like it was a big thing. And then she says, and blah, blah, blah. I did this. And I got COBOL to work on microcomputers when they didn't have enough memory, blah, blah, blah. She's just this, you know, badass who planned this giant party on a warship <laughs> and hung out with Walter Cronkite. It was amazing. Um, so Grace has a warship named after her. Right now, this is out in the Middle East. I, I really can't wait for the ship to come back so I can tour it, so I can see it. A really interesting thing about this ship is they only put one women's restroom in it. And so many service women wanted to work on that ship and requested to work on that, that ship that they had to put more women's restrooms in it. And it made them go over budget because they hadn't thought about that in their design. Um, this is why it's called, like, this ship is, is known to have golden toilets. And this is what they mean by it, is because they had to put more, like, female restrooms and shower rooms in the ship because so many women requested to be on this boat, uh, which is amazing. Another misconception about Grace Hopper is that she was a feminist, that she was all for women's rights. We really uphold that a lot. Grace Hopper got hers. Grace Hopper believed in the meritocracy even while upholding the same double standards of gender uh, that a lot of women did. You know, she chose her career over a family. She had to, those were the only two choices. Um, she was a staunch Republican. This meritocracy did not believe that she thought women shouldn't do things. Certainly, one of the, program the best programmers she ever met, Betty Hogarth, there's not a lot on her, but everything about her you should read about. Um, you know, she made sure that even after Betty got married and had a baby, normally, you know, once you get married, you get fired, up until the 70s, uh, she made sure that she could program from home. This is before the internet, so think about it. <laughs> think about what this meant, like carting back and forth programs while you have a baby at home. Um, So some, some really interesting things about Grace that make her like more palpable, or at least more salacious, I think, is that Grace smoked like a chimney, right? And once, once she got to the point where she was a uh, rear admiral, if you, if you wanted to employ Grace, you had to make sure she had a smoking office. So often, and this is true also of Einstein, which who you probably didn't know was a smoker either, is they both demanded from the companies uh, in the institutions they worked for that their offices were smoking offices. And they would not work there if that wasn't true. So often, both 
both Einstein and Grace, they were like the smokers lounge in their offices and smoked often. So later in Grace's life, when she was uh, hospitalized often, etc., she would hide packs of cigarettes all over the place, under her bed, behind the toilet. She, she was just like, I'm old, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna, like, this was just her thing. Um, and that's it. That's all we have time for, really. I think I went over, I'm sorry. But if you have questions about Grace, my mind is full of information. I've been making this film for three years now. So I'm ready to answer them. Um, I'm interested in your comment about her not being a feminist. Did she say that? She sure did. And she you have said, to, I am not. I am not a feminist. You have to think about that time, right? You have to think about the time when feminism was like that was the thing. I mean, you had radical feminists and you had nothing else. I mean, there wasn't a lot of, there was like Betty Verdan feminist, which was, you know, pill popping mamas. And then you had, you know what? We're going to break this shit down. But Grace was a Republican. Grace also had built her entire reputation on following the rules enough and subverting them just enough. So she rode that line. So as much as I would love to claim her in like being one of those people who broke boundaries for the sake of breaking boundaries, she broke them because she loved math. She broke them because she loved to code. She broke them because she loved to teach young people about math and coding. She did not break them for us. She broke them for her and for her own passion. And it takes all kinds to make a world, but that's like a hard thing for me too, because I, I want to hold her up there. And I can, I can be like, this woman did things for us, but that's not what was in her heart. She just wanted to do things. Yes. I have a question from the internet. Uh, I've been tweeting, and someone said uh, um, about the uh, the uh, um, Edo uh, compiler. Uh, cool, but that drawing rep depicts operations on a stack. That's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> but they can look up the Edo compiler and get it off of archive.org. Okay. I'm just curious if she did any work in the non-military commercial or otherwise non-military software worlds. I totally glossed over that, but yes, she did. So she worked at ENIAC. An interesting thing about this is if you read uh, another great programmer who wrote an autobiography, Jean Bartok's book. She didn't talk about Grace a lot working there, uh, but Jean and Grace did not get along. But there's some great stuff about her working with ENIAC. Uh, Sometimes she was in the military during that, sometimes she wasn't. She was often working on military contracts at that time and still had servicemen under her, even when she wasn't with the Navy. It gets complicated. Uh, but, you know, when she did that Letterman piece, she actually work in, worked for a digital equipment company. Um, so she did, she did a lot of consulting. She did a, a lot with out, outside of the Navy. You know, the first time she was let go from the Navy, it was crushing to her. She had found her purpose, her job. She had found a place where people respected her. And she was absolutely crushed when they're like, you know what, you're a woman, we don't need you anymore. And uh, she was able to work at Harvard instead, still within the same community, um, working as faculty at Harvard for a while. And so that, that kind of saved her there. Um, as, a, as a former math teacher, I'm interested to know if there was anything written about like, how she became so interested in math in the first place at a young age. So her father was an insur in insurance. So he had one of those first adding machines. Uh, her mother loved mathematics. Now her mother went to school at a time where they didn't teach anything past algebra to women. So she really clung to helping her daughters with their homework because they advanced past that. Um, so she had a family that also loved math and that really fostered it for her. She was also intensely curious you know, she took a, she tells a story of taking apart seven alarm clocks in a night as a six-year-old. Uh, I actually tried to have my six-year-old do this, and it, this is impossible. Uh, so however many she took apart, it wasn't six, but the story got, I assume, bigger and bigger. Uh, but she did take apart an alarm clock. We took one apart and put it back together. It was very fun. I had to find one from 1905 and be okay with destroying it, or from 1910, which is when they started coming out commercially. So... Yeah, uh, you mentioned that 
the fact that she invented the compiler didn't really penetrate popular culture because it's hard to explain. I'm curious, do you try to explain it in the movie? And if so, how do you try to make it an accessible concept for people? Uh, right now, we're just saying we, she helped turn uh, mathematical computations into human language. Um, trying to explain more than that, we are really, we are really wrestling with not infanticizing our, our audience and how to make that a concept that they really get. Uh, if anyone has any suggestions about that, you know, if you can graphically explain, explain a compiler and how it actually works. Uh, by the way, you know, Grace was actually hired the second time by the Navy because she was the only one who could check a compiler's compiling. She was the only one who knew how to do that. <laughs> that's amazing, right? You just look at the, the product at the end and that's how you know it works. But she actually had to check all of that stuff and she was the only person on the planet who still knew how to do that because she invented the thing. Uh, so that's fun to think about. Uh, I'm curious, uh, you mentioned that she didn't consider herself a, f a feminist, but you also mentioned several roadblocks that she ran into in her personal life that at least you attribute somewhat to patriarchy or to sexism. And so I'm curious what her interpretation was of those obstacles that she experienced and what her perspective was on uh, what it took for her to maintain the positions that she did. If if this was something that she attributed to being a woman and felt like she needed a change, she never talked about it. Um, if it was a roadblock that she ran up against and she wanted it, she would find a way to subvert the system. Right? I think, I think anyone in any position would do that, but Grace was especially adept at it. She was not just a computer programmer, she was an excellent social engineer. Cool. All right, well, thank you, Melissa. Thank you.